And then they tried to like limit the angle, like the, how much they that affected it, but they couldn't. And as they got more realistic, they found that the graph became like level and then almost asymptotical. Bro, I know for a fact Joe is shitting. Oh, you recording? Joe, I know for a fact you're shitting your pants right now. Okay, we're like, going to start here in a few minutes. Uh, my name is Mark Uli. I'm from Houghton College. I'll be chairing this uh, section, and uh, I'll introduce each speaker. Um, when 10 minutes is up, I will stand up. Okay. So that's your signal to wrap it up. Yeah. And 15 minutes, um, I get a big hook and I'll just pull your off. <laughs> so, um, how much time do we have? Our first speaker is uh, Joseph Vargas from SUNY Fredonia. Observing monoenergetic can decay at rest, neutrinos, and the Icarus effect. Yes. <clears throat> All right, so hello everyone. Like you said, I'm Joe. Um, so I'll be talking about some research that I did this past summer at UOR, um, working with Dr. Chris Marshall, uh, grad student Jack Smedley, and Dr. Faza Akbar. Um, and like Professor Yuli said, uh, we, it, our project was um, determining the feasibility of observing these monoenergetic canon decay at rest neutrinos in the Icarus detector at Fermi. All right, so first, table of contents. Um, so first I'll go into a little background about neutrinos, um, and then some motivation, you know, why we thought this would be interesting, what we thought we could learn from it, um, and then some of my roles, and then our results. Um, so first, a little overview. So neutrinos are the smallest particle in the standard model. I'm sure most of you are sure of that, or know that already. Um, but they're extremely abundant in the universe, but you know, rarely interact with matter. Um, there's several ways in which they're produced. You know, they're byproducts of nuclear reactions, fission and fusion. So, like Thomas's talk earlier, um, they can be produced by stars, from supernovas, um, from nuclear reactors. And then, specifically for our project, we cared most about um, neutrinos from beam uh, created for experimental purposes, which is done at Fermilab. Um, so first, we have a rough schematic of the NUMI neutrino beam at Fermilab. Um, to kind of explain how it works. Um, so it starts out with 120, so well, very high energy proton beam uh, from the main injector at Fermilab. <clears throat> it hits this graphite beam target, which produces charged pions. Um, those get shot through the magnetic horn system, um, where you, know, you can either send the positively charged or negatively charged particles, but not both, because then they annihilate. Um, and then whatever you choose gets sent down the decay pipe, where it decays into a muon and the corresponding neutrino, uh, which is the muon neutrino. Um, and then once they're through the decay pipe, they'll either get picked up by the uh, neutrino detectors or they'll hit the beam dump. Um, but the most important thing uh, from the schematic that you should gather is that you know there's so many neutrinos produced, there's no way that we could know the energy of any single one of these neutrinos. So there's a large spectrum of different energies in this beam. Um, so next, some motivation for this study. Um, so I'll first explain a little bit about the Icarus detector. Um, so it's a liquid argon time projection chamber, which is like well, some big words, but all it really is is like some cryostats of liquid argon. Um, and then on the inside, you have these like three-dimensional arrays, wired arrays, um, because neutrinos are neutral, so we can never actually observe them. And as you can see over to the right here, um, when they interact with the argon nuclei, they produce these outgoing charged particles that ionize the gas and then leave these measurable tracks that we can measure. 
Um, and then using that, we can actually figure out the energy of the incoming neutrino. Um, so typically, this is like this is a step in the analysis process, um, and you know it it, it takes time. Um, and there's one way in which we can improve this, and that's by studying these monoenergetic neutrino interactions. So studying interactions of neutrinos that have constant energy that we know. Um, and luckily, that happens at Fermilab. So along the Numi beam line, um, <clears throat> we have the high energy protons first hitting that graphite beam target. But if some of them get by, if some of them escape by and travel further down the beam line, eventually hitting the beam dump, they'll actually produce these positively charged kaon particles. Um, and then those particles will be slowed to rest in the beam dump and produce these monoenergetic neutrinos that have an energy of roughly about 236 MeV per neutrino. Um, so the ultimate goal of our project, right, is to determine if we could actually measure these neutrinos, determine if we could actually see them. Um, and why, you know, is because it would be a first measurement of its kind on argon. Um, you know, looking ahead in the future at future neutrino experiments such as Dune, well, actually I just know about Dune. I think Dune is using uh, liquid argon as a medium in their detectors as well, so it would be good to make a measurement like this so we can know what to expect in the future. Um, and then lastly, to just understand you know, the challenges associated with this. Um, and then this accompanying plot is a differential cross-section of a KDAR neutrino on carbon. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of different theories of what is going to happen or what people predict. Um, and so our ultimate goal, if we could determine that this is feasible, is to actually perform the experiment and you know, create a plot where we can add data points and kind of just put an end to this disagreement. Um, now onto what I did. So I just have uh, one plot here, but all I did all summer was work with what, these large simulated event, uh, neutrino events, these KDAR events, um, sit, uh, from the beam dump, and I made plots of different interaction parameters. So this one is just the phase space, you know, representing all the possible states of energy and momentum transferred from that KDAR neutrino to the argon nuclei. Um, and so it's possible. What's nice about this is that it's possible using only the detector observables. So you know, information that the detector can directly read, and that is like the kinematics of the outgoing muon that's produced, it's one of those charged particles. Um, and so this plot is nice because it's, you know, it's like the particle physicist bread and butter. You could like derive a cross-sectional measurement from this. Um, so yeah, so that's, I just made plots like this of different parameters and whatnot. Um, now onto results. So we found that, you know, using the original setup of the new beam, we cannot get a good KDAR signal from originating from the beam though. Um, so this plot right here, um, on the bottom we have, or on the x-axis, we have you know, the flux of neutrinos from, well, with respect to Icarus's xz plane, and then yz plane on the y-axis. Um, and as you notice, there's a color bar indicating you know, yellow being a high flux of neutrinos, you know, and black being a low flux. Um, and so the beam target with respect to this coordinate system is actually right here. So it makes sense that you know lots of neutrinos are produced there. That's how it's set up. That's how that's what's supposed to happen. And then right here is actually where the beam dump would be. So as you can see, there's there's some KDAR uh, neutrinos coming from here, but it's pretty washed out. You know we can't really get a good measurement just to just because of all of, like this boomerang figure in total. Like we just can't get anything. From it. Another problem that we ran into is that we had extremely limited angular resolution. So. Um, kind of like the solar neutrino problem, or how that was solved. Um, people could make discriminating cuts on these neutrino events based on incoming direction, right? And that makes sense looking at this schematic, because most of our background neutrinos should originate in this area. And if Icarus is over here, it's going to come in in a completely different direction, while our KDAR neutrinos should be coming in from about the bottom. Um, so what we did is to reconstruct the direction of the incoming neutrino, we kind of have to like sum up the momentum components of final state particles that are produced. Um, so we did this three different ways. Our first assumption was super basic, and it was not realistic to what we would actually see at all. So what we did is we summed up all the final state particle momentum components, and so it corresponds to this red line. And as you can see, there's a large peak here. So you know, if we had a magic detector that could pick up every single outgoing particle, then we could possibly discriminate based on incoming direction. Um, but as we get more realistic, our blue line here is basically the same thing now excluding neutrons because we can never see those, they're the neutral particles. Um, you can see that the peak lowers and then green being our most realistic assumption. 
um, with a now 50 MeV proton threshold, um, the line becomes pretty isotropic. You can see the peak is pretty low. So, you know, factoring the actual response of the detector, that line would be basically flat, meaning that we'd see neutrinos coming in from every single direction. So we can't make any discriminating cuts based off of that. Um, so eventually, you know, this was about halfway through the summer we found out of this information. And Dr. Marshall came up with a good idea of what if we were to just, you know, perform a hypothetical special run where we remove that graphite beam target. So in principle, this is a really good idea because it would remove all of the production of the background neutrinos while also increasing the amount of KDAR production at the beam dump because now the proton beam is directly incident on the beam dump. Um, <clears throat> but we made a similar plot as the one I showed you before. And as you can see, there's still production of neutrinos along the beam line, but the KDAR signal is a lot brighter, meaning that it's a lot better. There's a lot more KDAR neutrinos produced. But because of um, air literally in the target hole, when you remove it, uh, the protons backscatter up the nitrogen and oxygen in the air and produce more neutrino events. So basically, we, <laughs> we, it's going to be really hard to measure these KDAR neutrinos. Um, so yeah, in summary, like I just said, it's very hard to get a measurement like this. Um, and some of the ongoing work that we've discussed in the past is just how we could figure out an experimental setup in which we could make discriminating cuts to get a measurement on these KDAR neutrinos. Um, and that's all. So I can take any questions. I'd just like to say People I worked with at U of R this past summer. But yeah, if you guys have any questions, I'll take them. Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> could you go back to the? Uh, I forgot which slide it was. I think it was the when you first said like you. Like if you go back and then go back. I forgot which one, but um, it, it was it was the first issue you ran into where you said um. Oh, just the large background. Yeah, like you, you couldn't measure the, the neutrinos to... Yeah. So like, um, I think I'm just slightly confused why, so if you don't mind reiterating that again. Oh, oh, because it's just like, we, like the signal is completely washed out. There's too many neutrinos from originating from different sources, so we can't directly assume that, you know, these inter neutrino interactions that we see are from the KDAR source, so it's just like a washed out signal. It's like, you know, there's too much noise in the measurement just from other events. I see, yeah. all right, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, maybe, I'm not entirely sure. I honestly haven't talked to Dr. Marshall about this in a while, but um, I'm not sure exactly what where he's at with the project right now. And I think Jack is also, the like, grad student that we were working with, is also working on, uh, on it right now. But I can definitely bring it up uh, next time I talk to him, but I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. I assume this goes outside your scope a little bit, but yeah. it seems like you're trying to do something very hard uh, with yeah. the detectors that you have. Yeah. You specifically say like, oh, well, you know, our process uses the ionization of this argon liquid, mm -hmm. but you're trying to detect particles that don't ionize liquid. So like, is there a better way to do this? You should you be uh, investigating this method at all, I guess. Like, as why in, like, keep pushing hard at this instead of just like finding a way around? As in like, as in like seeing the neutrinos in entirely? Or yeah, like, why are you trying to use this method specifically to find the neutrinos instead of trying to use a different method? Oh, well, okay, so that was, that was, um, you know, brought up in the beginning, because if we were able to get a good measurement from these simulations that could support, you know, a possible proposal to Fermilab, then this experiment would be cost-free, mm -hmm. because the NUMI experiment is already occurring, and actually, I think it, it shut down in like a year or so, or maybe it got, it's over already. Um, but the idea was that, like, if we could, you know, write a paper on this and, like, get decent results, then we could go to Fermilab and say, we could do this for free, and it would help us out in the future, you know what I mean? So, like, that's why we investigated it. Mm -hmm. Or using this method. 